Good morning, everyone. Would you stand and worship with us this morning? And we're going to sing to a God who is worthy of worship in every season and every moment. Let's sing together. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Where we hear praises, he hears fear. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray. Where we hear worship, he hears for the first time last week and this song is about coming into a new season as a church and so sing it with me today believe it believe it for your life and believe it for our church let's sing it together
sing this out. Fear is not my future. Fear is not my future. You are, you are. Sickness is not my story. You are, you are. Heartbreak's not my home. You are, you are. And death is not the end, Jesus. You
You may be seated. Good morning, Crossing Church. All right. Welcome to all of you here at North Main. Welcome to those online. My name is Chris. I'm so glad to see you guys here today. Uh, if it's your first time here, or if you've just started coming to the crossing, uh, we want you to know we are so glad that you're here uh, today. Uh, as you leave, if you'll fill out a connect card in the lobby, you can also meet with the pastors back in the back corner over here. Uh, as you leave today, we'd love to get to know you better. You can also use this little handy QR code that's on our screen. You can use your camera and give us some information that way as well. You know, yesterday I got an opportunity to do something that I don't get to do as often as I would like. Uh, I got to play golf yesterday. Yay! It was cool. Uh, it was cool on the first tee box as I actually hit the ball in the middle of the fairway and I thought, wow, I haven't played in like three months and this is, this is great. Well, reality set in. So I needed a, I needed a way maker a miracle worker as, as my game got worse and worse and worse and worse. And so about, I don't know, the fifth fairway, I almost got to a point, and all of us who have played golf have gotten to this part probably, where you want to take your club and do what? Throw it, well, throw it, maybe throw it in the lake or just bang it on the ground. And I almost got to that point, And it was in that moment that I started thinking, what, what are you doing? You haven't played golf in like two or three months. You're out here today, it is beautiful out here. It was like 78 degrees, sun was shining. I was out with my, with my father-in-law and my brother and my brother-in-law and I was like, man, this is, a, this is a, an amazing day. Why am I such in a bad mood about this? And it was in that moment when I started really feeling like, you know, I need to change my attitude. You know, sometimes when we come to this point of the service, we bring a lot of things to church you know we got a lot going on in our lives and there's a lot of things that we could really be focused on that are things that aren't going as well in our life but if we really think about it there are many more things in life that we should be focused on that are good and the thing that probably all of us should recognize that we are ultimately we are all children of God and that he loves us so much that he sent his only son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins to provide us life in life abundantly through him. When you came in this morning, you should have received one of these communion kits. If you did not get a chance to do so, if you would just simply raise your hand and someone will come around and make sure that you get one of those. For the next few moments as we partake together, I challenge you to not think about all the other things that are going on in life. That doesn't mean they're not there, but focus on Jesus. Focus on the life that he gives you through his sacrifice. Take a few moments now and partake. You know, I wouldn't necessarily refer to myself as Mr. Social Media. I do get on there from time to time, and, and, but I had a little bit of time yesterday and I got on there and I, and I saw a post that just kind of touched my heart a little bit. It was a, a young man that had worked with me uh, at the YMCA and he was just posting about some things that he was thankful about in life. And he talked about some specific uh, instances where uh, some people had said things or done things that had made an impact on him and he threw my name out there and I was very appreciative of that. You know, we have the opportunity each and every uh, Lord's Day to come in and give back a portion of the blessings that God has given to us. And you know, you just never know. You never know what you do, what you say, what you do by giving of your tithes and offerings, what you never know what that might do to impact the life of someone. That someone may be someone that you never ever get a chance 
here on earth at least, to see and understand, but one day we will all know. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to, to give. Every single day, God, not just today, we are given opportunities to give back, whether it be through our monies, our time, our effort. Lord, I just pray that we would seek those opportunities and that we would continue to do those things because you did that for us. Lord, I pray for Pastor Eddie this morning as he brings our message. And Lord, help us to take the words that you put in his mouth that he delivers to us today and help us, Lord, to go out and be your hands and feet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Hey, so good to see you. Hey, my name's Eddie, one of the pastors here. Hey, if you are new or you've been coming for a little bit, we would love to meet you after service right in the back. And I got to say, thank you guys. This has been a season that we have been in as a church and wanted to say from my end, just thank you for your prayers and the encouragement and uh, just want to say thank you. Now, it has been really, really cool the last several weeks as a church. We've been seeing God do some really, really incredible things. The last three weeks as a church, we have seen the highest non-holiday post-COVID attendance numbers. That's a little bit of a tongueful. But we really have seen God do some really incredible things over the last a uh, couple months, really, as a church. And, and we're starting a new series today because we recognize that as a church, we're at a crossroads, right? We, we, we just kind of had this leadership transition happen, and we find ourselves at a crossroads. And so we thought it would be wise for us to just kind of step back over the next couple of weeks and as a church step back and, and just kind of look at where we are and to be reminded of who we are, who we are as a church. And so we're going to be looking at a passage found in the book of Luke in the fifth chapter. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. But we're going to be looking at a story today that reminds us, as the people of God, on who we are supposed to be. We see a story of a group of guys who bring this person through some very unusual ways to bring, them, to bring him to Christ. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 5, starting in verse 17. We're just diving right into the Word today. Is that cool with you guys? All right. Verse 17 says this, One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. When they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him to the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. So here we have, right in the middle of this teaching, Jesus has his house packed full of people, and we see these people who, who, who recognize there's a paralyzed man and that man needs to meet Jesus, they recognize that they need to do anything and everything to get him to Jesus. Now, we don't know in this story, we don't know if they were friends with the paralyzed man. We don't know how they knew him. We didn't know if they knew him at all. But we see their faith, we see their boldness come to Jesus, I want us to notice when we look at this text, the faith of those people. They had the faith to say, no, 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 we're going to do anything and everything to reach him to Jesus. And as we find ourselves at this crossroads at a church, we need to be reminded of who we are. We are people called to reach people for Christ. I put it this way, to break through barriers, to bring people 
to Jesus, to Jesus. That is one of the things I love about our church is that we have been relentlessly pursuing our community and people around us to reach them for Jesus. I use the phrase wreck the roof. We see in this story that these guys wrecked the roof to bring this paralyzed man to Jesus. We see this audacity, this boldness, this courage that they would bring him to Jesus to wreck the roof. What roofs are you wrecking, right? Hopefully none literally, okay, that would be bad and insurance would have to come out. But, but figuratively, what people in your life that you're going, man, I need to be intentional with what I say, how I say it, so that I can be Jesus to my coworker. So I can be Jesus to my family member. You know, just this past service, uh, a gentleman came up to me and was telling his story and telling a little bit about how God gave him multiple opportunities throughout his life to be Jesus to his friends. And he took those opportunities to he used the language to be salt, that he would be someone that would be on mission for God in his everyday life. It goes on in verse 22, or in verse 20. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now notice in this text, it's something that I, 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 I saw that I go, man, that sticks out. In verse 20 it says, when Jesus saw their faith. When he saw their faith, how did he see it? Because they were actively, imagine the dust falling and if you're Jesus and the house is full and all of a sudden, you, you, you're, you're talking, and all of a sudden you get some, some dust on you, some debris on you. And imagine that mat just falling to the ground, and, and they are, are lowering him down. And just see how the atmosphere in that room probably changed. Jesus saw their faith because they were people of action. They were people that actually said, we are going to do anything to reach our friend for Jesus but also in this text, something very interesting starts to happen. That the religious leaders start to get frustrated. It's interesting in this story, this is really the first moment where we see organized opposition towards Jesus as a new leader experiencing friction, that the, the establishment of the religious leaders, the teachers of the law, they do not like what they see in this young religious or Jewish leader. That he is now saying, friend, your sins are forgiven. He's telling the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven because only God can forgive sins. So Jesus goes on in verse 22. It says, Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? I've always thought when I've read this text that the religious leader said this to Jesus. And it wasn't until I actually kind of was combing through this passage. Notice that it said the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves began thinking. They were, it was just a thought in their head. But notice that in verse 22, we see that Jesus, it says Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are these things, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? You see, we see in verse 22 that God is a God of the heart. God really cares about your motives. And sometimes in church, we don't really think about that, do we? We kind of just think, well, I got to sign up or I got to do this or I got to do that. And all of a sudden, we realize, no, God cares about your motives. God cares about your intentions. God cares about the posture of your heart. And, and, he, and he goes, 
you were thinking that. Why are you thinking that in your heart? It is, it is so humbling to know that God cares about your heart and he cares about your motives of your heart. Now, I know here in the South we say, bless your heart, right? And that usually means something else. It means multiple things a lot of times. But he says, bless. And he doesn't say, bless your heart. <laughs> no, he says, he sees your heart and he sees your intentions. In verse 23, it says this. It says, which is easier, Jesus says, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. And they were filled with awe. And everyone said, we have seen remarkable things today. You see, in this story, we see two qualities of who Jesus is. One, that he is the authority of God. That because he is God, he has the authority to forgive sins. Quality one. Quality two is his compassion. That he wants to see this man get up and walk. And in this story kind of intertwines these two aspects of who Jesus is, his authority and his compassion. And the religious leaders of the day do not like what they see. And it's interesting to think when we see this story, we see when the mat is brought down and, and this chaotic moment kind of happens, you would think, as you're a listener in the room, you would think, here's a paralyzed man. The most obvious thing we, that Jesus needs to do first is to help this guy get up and walk, right? He's paralyzed and he needs physical healing. But we see in the story that he doesn't do that. He says, no, the top priority is that your, your sins have been forgiven. And then he brings physical healing. You see, for a lot of us, we may think, or logic would say, that it is easier to say one's sins are forgiven, right? That, hey, your sins are forgiven, you're good to go. But, but that is not true, because that's actually more, more difficult, because you have to have the authority to do that. And Jesus brings these two things together. You see, he acts so that the audience can see that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, but also he has the compassion to tell him to get up and walk. You see, he enables this hard thing, having the paralyzed man get up and walk, but the harder thing is to say, friend, your sins are forgiven. But as the story kind of wraps up in verse 26, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This story is not actually so much about these faithful, bold, courageous people who picked up the mat and brought the paralyzed man to Jesus. The miracle is in who Jesus is and that he has the authority and the compassion to heal and to forgive sins. And we see that man get up and walk. But I also want us to not forget the simple fact that this story would have never happened if those people didn't act, if they didn't get up and they didn't have the boldness, the courage, the faithfulness, the obedience to say, hey, 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 I need to do anything and everything to reach this person towards Jesus. You see, friend, when we walk in obedience to God, he gets glory. 
When we start being led by his spirit and we start living by his word and we are people that are on mission for God, then God can use your life in powerful ways for his glory. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be reminded as we find ourselves at this crossroads that our lives are, are really all about giving glory to God. And so let's go back to this part of the story, the very beginning, where Jesus saw their faith. Saw the faith of the people who wrecked the roof. As I think about who we are as a people, my prayer is that we have three kind of phrases as we bring people towards Jesus and we say, we're going to wreck the roof to breach people for Christ. There are three phrases that maybe uh, might encourage you today as you bring people toward Jesus. Number one is the phrase, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. This is where we as people, we uh, look for opportunities. We ask and we seek that we would be used by God. It is uh, uh, this past Tuesday, actually, we were in a staff meeting and we were just kind of allowing a moment to share God's stories or what we call God's stories. This is the moment where we celebrate all the things that God is doing in our church, and we look at this past week. We talk about what was something great on Sunday morning, if there was a, a great thing that happened during the week, if we heard of uh, God working through miraculous ways in, in someone's life. We share these stories, and it's really an incredible time, one of my favorite parts of the whole week. And we always just kind of allow anyone and everyone to share, man, where do we see God move in our church? And, and Philip, who helps lead our, our production team, he told us this story. He said, you know, last week, last Sunday, uh, we had six baptisms here. And um, uh, one of the uh, production guys who had a microphone, he heard him kind of whisper kind of underneath his breath. He goes, Lord, thank you for allowing me that I get to be a part of this. And you know what? That's exactly the right attitude. I can't believe I get to be a part of this. Lord, use me. God, I want my life to be used for your glory. It is this element of saying, I can't believe, God, that you would invite me into your story and I get to be a part of something bigger than myself. So how do we practically do this? If we, if we want to be a people to say, Lord, use me, how can we do that? When we interact with people, how can we say, Lord, use me? How can I give an encouraging word? I want to give three practical things that are the three not cues. I, I stole this from another pastor in Atlanta. And here's what he says. When you hear these three nots, these are good reminders. These bells should be ringing off to say, hey, 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 this is an opportunity to give an encouraging word, to have a spiritual conversation, to invite someone to church. When you hear these three things, this is an opportunity, an open door for you to speak. Number one, when things are not going well. When you hear someone say, man, things are not going well in my life. I can't believe I just lost my job. I can't believe that things are happening this way. Things are not going well. When you hear that, that's an opportunity for us to say, hey, why don't you come to our church? Or hey, we have this thing called grief share that we would love to invite you to. Number two, I was not prepared for to be honest, I wasn't prepared for the divorce. To be honest, I wasn't prepared for losing my job. When you hear moments of that, that's an opportunity for you to maybe give an encouraging word, to, to, to maybe pray with them, to say, hey, God is with you. God is for you. And the last one, I am not from here. Uh, a guy just... Uh, even before the service started, he said, hey, be on the lookout. I have my neighbors coming today. They just moved from the Midwest. Well, that's an opportunity 
that he had when he said, hey, my neighbors aren't from here. I invited them to church. That is an opportunity where he said, I recognize they're probably looking for for community. They're probably looking for a church home. They're looking for a sense of a foundation. That's a great open door. So first phrase is, Lord, use me. The second one, one at a time, one at a time. You may have a heart to change Kernersville, the triad, the state of North Carolina, and the world, but how that happens is by one conversation at a time, by one kind gesture at a time, by one prayer at a time. It happens one at a time. A, uh, a bad uh, husband moment, if I can have confession time for a second, was, uh, some of you guys are really nervous right now. I remember my wife and I, Samantha, we were, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a year or two in our marriage, and I was a pastor serving in Florida, and and I was away for the weekend, and yet she was still at church, and, and uh, at that week in particular, the church was doing a thing called a Compassion Weekend, where an organization called Compassion International uh, would come in, and there would be all these little brochures of all these kids uh, from all throughout the world where you could essentially sponsor, and for, I don't know, 40-something dollars a month, you could sponsor a child, and that kid would get basic uh, uh, clothing and basic food, will get uh, an education, would uh, get connected to a church, and that person, that kid, would, uh, would ultimately get all those things for 40 something dollars a month. And the rates that you see of kids coming to know Jesus through that sponsorship program is insane. And so I got back from my trip and my wife comes home all excited because she picked up one of these sponsorship packets and, and she brings it and she goes, look, look what we got. And in my heart, became very hard and cold, if I'm being honest. Because I didn't see a kid that was going to get basic food or basic shelter or basic, you know, anything like that. I saw, uh uh-oh, we have a multiple thousand dollar financial commitment because this kid's three years old and I'm doing the math, 40-something dollars a month times 12 times 15 years. I'm having confession time, I told you, okay? And I really regretted that moment because in that moment, what my wife was trying to do was trying to change one life. She can't change all of the country of Uganda, but for that one kid, she could radically change his life. And just this past week, I saw a letter that my wife wrote to our sponsorship kid. And I just realized Change in this world through Jesus happens one at a time. And I was so concerned by a stupid dollar amount. And you know what? The Lord's totally provided that and then some. And it just took a moment to say, God, I'm going to be faithful with this moment right here and right now. And I'm going to have this conversation right here and right now because I know change happens one at a time. You know, in our church, actually this Sunday, if you go right out to the lobby, there's a, a, a board where we have clipped up on um, um, the lattice board out there. We have some kids in our church family that you have an opportunity to, quote, adopt a kid. And that means that for the next year, you would be committed to praying for this kid who is in our church Man, if you want to see change happen in our church family, it starts by prayer. And if we want to see the next generation be uh, one for Christ, it's going to happen by one prayer at a time, one conversation at a time, one uh, discipleship moment, one at a time. And so you have an opportunity today to grab a kid's uh, card and you pray for them for this year. The last one, so Lord, use me one at a time. And the last one, whatever it takes. 
Whatever it takes. That's one of the things I love about our church is the whatever it takes moment. And I've had the opportunity to see Pastor Pete front and center do whatever it takes to reach people for Christ. This past Sunday, we uh, saw uh, six baptisms. We saw God work in some powerful ways. But in this service, there is a little girl named Avery, nine years old. Avery, are you in here today? thought maybe she would be. Avery, Avery, are you here? Can you stand up just for a second? Are you, uh, uh, hey, Avery, Avery, you didn't even let me tell the story yet. I'll tell you. Okay, Avery, last week, Avery, during uh, the worship time, Avery, uh, uh, during the worship time, Pastor Pete uh, came down here and was sharing uh, hey, if you want to come forward today just as you are and come forward and be baptized, and Avery did. And uh, the backstory, I got to talk to your mom, Avery, this past week. And one of the things, Avery, your mom said was you've had a lot of conversations with your great-grandfather on the golf course and, and having spiritual conversations with some family and, the, and here at the church. And you've had the opportunity to know who Jesus is. And when that song happened, Avery was hearing, hearing Pastor Pete's words. She, she was telling her mom, Mom, I want to go. And her mom, of course, music being loud and people have already been back there preparing to get baptized. Mom's kind of confused going, okay, where do you want to go? I want to go. I want to go. Where do you want to go? To go forward. I want to tell she. Uh, this is a quote I wrote down. I'm, I'm telling the world that I believe in Jesus. And what's amazing you know, her mom says, okay, well, why don't you think about it for a second? And about 30 seconds later, she says, I think I'm ready. Well, Dina Blake, she, she works here at the church. She was kind of hearing this conversation and unsure about what to do and where do I go? It might be too late. Maybe we'll have to try again later. Dina grabs uh, Miss Avery and takes her up to the stage. And we actually have the video of it. So go ahead and watch this. Chloe, would you repeat that great confession with me? I believe, I believe that, Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and my Savior. Because of that profession of faith, I will now baptize you for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. changes of clothes back here so she's going to be fine but how brave she is to come this morning and give her life to Jesus Avery would you repeat that great confession with me I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son the Son of the living God my Lord and my Savior, and my and my Savior. Amen. amen Avery because of that confession of faith I'll now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit mission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Avery, I have a card for you after service. Come see me. I'd love to give it to you. Let me just say this, Avery. 
following Jesus is the best decision you'll ever make. More important than the person you marry, the job you have. Following Jesus is an adventure. There's highs and there's lows. There's good days and bad days, but it's worth it. It's worth it, and we're so excited for you. Can we give it up for Miss Avery? You know, it was, it was interesting on that on that Tuesday day, Pastor Pete, we were kind of sharing stories and we were laughing a lot of stories with Pastor Pete. And, you know, Pastor Pete was kind of wrapping things up and he was saying some nice words. And he said, you know, that little girl getting baptized on Sunday will leave a lasting impression of what ministry is all about. Having people come where they are to meet Jesus. And that's what it's all about. And maybe there's some of you today that you've realized that God has wrecked the roof to reach you. That he sent his son, Jesus, to pay the price of your sins so that you could have a relationship with him. And friend, today, if you wanna give your life to Jesus Christ and be like our friend Avery, why don't you come forward today? Hey, if you get baptized in your clothes, I'll, I'll, get, I'll baptize you in these clothes. So is that a deal? Okay. And friend, all this happens one at a time. From the moments with her great-grandfather and the conversation on the golf course to the family to the church, of having those conversations of what does it mean to wreck the roof and to come to Jesus and that's what it's about. And as we find ourselves at this Crossroads Church, we need to be reminded what it's about to wreck the roof, to help people meet and know Jesus. We're going to have an opportunity to sing. And maybe today you want to come forward to the altar and pray. That'd be great if you came. And maybe today you want to come forward and say, I'm tired of living for myself. I see the radical love that Jesus has shown that he paved a way through Jesus Christ so I could have a relationship with him. Today, friend, if you want to give your life to Jesus, why don't you come forward and we'll, we'll help you get baptized. But let's stand and now let's respond to God through song. Come forward. <laughs>